So good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. So if you don't mind uh, turning off your laptops uh, so that we can discuss and interact as uh, humans without machines in between. Uh, so I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm a staff scientist at uh, IJC Lab uh, in Orsay, and uh, I have been uh, a member of the class collaboration since uh, the year 2000, and I'm currently the chair of the collaboration still for a couple of months, and then my term will be over and I'll go back to have a life. So I'm very, very happy to be here and give you these lectures. Um, as I mentioned yesterday in the presentation by Alberto, I was a HUG student back in the year 2000, when I guess most of you were not born yet. So it's uh, quite uh, humbling and exciting for me to come back uh, as a teacher after all this time. And uh, after having experienced uh, a very exciting uh, uh, professional career here at Jefferson Lab, and I hope uh, that these lectures can give you an idea of the physics we can do here at Jefferson Lab uh, and uh, uh, how you can have uh, a fun and interesting uh, research in this place. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, you are uh, mainly theorists or experimentalists. Uh, I don't really know about uh, your background. So I'm uh, an experimentalist. So if you see things that, if you're a theorist and see <laughs> disgusting things, please uh, uh, bear with me. So my, my presentation will be all uh, from the perspective of an, of an experimentalist. So I have uh, here an overall uh, outline of how my lectures will be. So it's going to be, uh, five lectures, two today and two tomorrow and one on Friday. So the title may seem mysterious, deep exclusive reactions. So the lecture of today will be mainly uh, devoted to make you understand what these reactions are and what we can uh, do with them. Mainly uh, the, the whole goal here is trying to understand uh, the structure of the nucleon, the proton and the neutrons by using the electromagnetic probe, in particular electroscattering, which is what we do here at Jefferson Lab. So today I will introduce uh, the reactions that have been used to understand the structure of the proton that are the elastic scattering, the deep inelastic scattering, and now the exclusive reactions, in particular with the measurement of a generalized pattern distribution. And then uh, the next lecture later today uh, will be more focused on a specific uh, uh, generalized part of distribution, the measurement of DVCS and results from Jefferson Lab at 6GV, and what we learned about the protons with these measurements. And then <clears throat> the lectures of tomorrow will be more focused on the present, on recent results, perspectives. And at the end, in the last lecture of Friday, I would like to give you a practical uh, explanation of what all this means from the practical point of view how an analysis of data that are taken at Jefferson Lab is carried out and uh, give you an idea of how the, the plots that I'm showing in all my presentation are actually obtained by the people like you, the students and the analyzers. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, uh, my first lecture with a little uh, uh, introduction. So matter uh, is, uh, uh, as you know, composed uh, by nuclei and nuclei are at their turn uh, made up of protons and neutrons. And protons and neutrons uh, uh, constitute the vast majority of uh, the mass of the visible universe, uh, about 99%. And uh, the constituents uh, of protons and uh, neutrons are quarks and gluons that are elementary particles that you see here as a part of the standard model of elementary particles. Uh, so their masses, the mass of the quarks are very small. So uh, basically most of the mass of the nucleon doesn't come from the mass of the constituents themselves, but by their interactions. And their interaction is codified and described in the theory of strong interaction, which is quark, uh, um, quantum quark chromodynamics, QCD. So QCD is all uh, in, in principle expressed into the Lagrangian of QCD that you see written here that could seem a harmless uh, equation, and uh, it's supposed to contain all the answers about uh, um, the structure of hadrons, but uh, uh, it's not really solvable in, um, 
in the regimes that are non-perturbative. And the, the, the structure of hadrons and protons themselves are typically non-perturbative regimes. So we cannot directly understand how protons work by looking at QCD. What we can do is uh, trying to model and trying to measure uh, phenomenological quantities that then we can try to relate uh, to the constituents and to QCD in the end. So uh, the proton is a typical example of QCD uh, at work. What we know about the content of the, pro of the proton is that it has two up quarks. Each, has quark, uh, each of these up quarks has charge two thirds and one down quark, negative one third charge. There can be any number of pairs of quarks, antiquarks, and any number of gluons. You see here a wave function uh, for the proton. So there are a set of fundamental questions that are mainly uh, the center of the program, of the experimental program here at Jefferson Lab. Uh, what is the origin of the proton mass? As I said before, the mass of the actual quarks is very, very little. So we need to understand how their motion and their interaction uh, produces the mass of the proton. And also, one thing we need to understand is the origin of the spin of the proton, the spin one half. How does it come from the different contributions of the constituents? So the spin of the quarks, of the gluon, the angular momentum of quarks and the gluons. So all these are the questions that need to be understood. And for the last 60 years or so, the experimental tool that has been used to understand the structure of uh, nucleon has been electron scattering. And uh, the reason why we use electrons is that electrons are elementary particles and they don't have a structure themselves and they have only inter um, electromagnetic interaction uh, with the nucleon uh, via the exchange of virtual photons. So this really allows us to sample the properties of the target itself. Um, the resolution of the probe, of the electron probe, is given by this quantity, Q squared, that you're going to see throughout all the rest of the le lectures, which is uh, the transverse momentum between the initial and the final electron. So it's, uh, it's the, basically the, what we call the virtuality, the mass of the, tra tra of the exchanged virtual photon. So this Q squared is inversely proportional to the wavelength with which we probe the structure of the proton. So uh, if we go from low Q square to high Q square, we are able to probe smaller and smaller distances within the proton. So what we have been doing in the past uh, 60 years with um, electron scattering. So at the beginning, uh, we learned about the fact that the proton was not a point-like particle by making elastic scattering of uh, electron over proton. And this uh, made us understand uh, that the proton is not point-like, and we could measure the charge distribution of the proton via the extraction of the electromagnetic form factor. And I will come back in the next slides on this. Also, we measure deeply inelastic scattering uh, at the end of the 60s. Uh, and this allowed us to discover the existence of the quarks, also called partons and measure their momentum and spin distribution, which are uh, the partant uh, distribution functions or PDFs. So let's see uh, about uh, uh, electron scattering, which is how we learned about uh, the composite structure of the proton. So uh, the experiments were carried out at Stanford in the late 50s by Robert Hofstadter. He had an electron beam that was hitting an hydrogen target, and uh, they, he measured both the recoil electron, sorry, recoil proton and the scattered electron. So, if uh, uh, the, the, the target, the proton, uh, was a point like object, the cross section should be described by this formula, which is the MOT uh, cross section formula. So, uh, what uh, Hofstadter did was uh, having this electron scattering on hydrogen and looking at the cross-section uh, dependence on the, on the scattered angle of the electron. And there are a set of curves that you see here on this plot, and uh, they are uh, theoretical curves for different hypotheses of the nature and the structure of the proton. So the bot curve that is described by this cross-section is this uh, uh, 
this one that you see, oh, the mod one is here, this one, and then you have different hypotheses, uh, uh, spin, uh, uh, anomalous uh, magnetic moment of the target and so on, but the measure, the cross-section was deviating for all, from all these hypotheses, and it was this one here. So um, what uh, this cross-section showed, uh, showed that was actually uh, the scattering was not happening on a point like the object, uh, and uh, it was described uh, by this Rosenbluth formulas, uh, that there are two possible ways to write it. The cross-section uh, becomes uh, a function of two form factors. So these form factors can be expressed either as F1 and F2 in the first formula, and in, and in this case, they will be called Dirac and Pauli form factors, or G, G, M, which are the electric and magnetic uh, form factors. So you, you see the formula, there is a, a dependence on this variable tau, which is the ratio on Q square over four times the mass of the nucleon. And then there is the uh, nucleon anomalous magnetic moment as well. So these two formula, of course, are equivalent and they are related. So there are relationship connecting the two uh, ways uh, to express uh, the form factors. And you can see that there are also limits at uh, Q square equals zero for what uh, the actual form factor uh, uh, mean. Uh, at uh, the electric form factor, a Q square equals zero is one. So we see at uh, small Q square, we see the total of the charge of, uh, of the proton. And of course, being neutral, the neutron uh, at the Q square equals zero, the uh, electric form factor is zero. So uh, long time passed since uh, uh, Ofstatter did the, his experiment. Uh, and in all this year, there has been an extensive experimental activity, in particular here at Jefferson Lab that has allowed us to measure the form factors uh, of the proton and of the neutron on uh, uh, a big uh, kinematic extent. Uh, it's something like five orders of magnitude in Q square. And uh, uh, so here you see uh, two uh, simplified views to make you understand uh, the meaning of the uh, form factor. So if we had uh, a point like charge, this form factor should be a constant. So no matter how um, small the wavelength with which you are probing your target is, you would still see all of the charge of this uh, object. However, uh, what is observed in reality is this uh, dipole uh, form of the, here you see actually the ratio of the um, electron, uh, uh, sorry, of the proton electric form factor over this dipole distribution, and it's mainly one uh, until you reach uh, uh, Q squared of the order of a few GV. And uh, what this dipole uh, uh, distribution tells you is that uh, as the, the resolution of your probe increases, you are seeing less charge. So basically you are hitting on an object that has a finite size. So the smaller you go, the less charge you see. So there has been experiment uh, measuring the form factor that were carried out all over the world. And the most recent ones are the ones carried out at MIT Bates, Mami Mines, and uh, here at Jefferson Lab with the CBUF accelerator. So an important uh, way to visualize the sense of uh, the form factor is remembering that uh, there is a relationship uh, linking the form factor to the charge distribution uh, as a function of the transverse position within the proton. So by uh, inverting this uh, Fourier transform, uh, it was possible to have a visualization of how the charge is distributed in proton and uh, neutrons. So you see the proton here, where the charge follows this exponential uh, uh, drop. And uh, the neutron itself, uh, there is this uh, interesting finding that the neutron as a whole is, neut is neutral, as the name says. But uh, uh, it's actually the charge is distributed in the way that there, there is a negative uh, inner core, and then there is a positive distribution in the outer surface. So all this was learned by uh, measuring the, um, the form factors of proton and, uh, and neutron. Uh, so after <clears throat> the measurement of Hofstadter of the laxis scattering, 
the energy available for the accelerator was increased, and so uh, more uh, sophisticated experiment could be uh, carried out. Uh, and uh, near the end of the 60s, uh, Taylor, Ken uh, Kendall, and Friedman carried out uh, experiments uh, at SLAC, uh, measuring what is uh, called the deep inelastic scattering. So uh, you see here a distribution of the cross section uh, as a function of the mass uh, W, which is the mass of the final uh, hadronic state. So if uh, you increase this energy, you sample different states uh, of your final, different uh, stat yeah, states of your final state, basically. So here you see uh, at the mass of the proton, you have uh, the elastic peak corresponding to the measurement done by Ofstadter. If you increase the energy, you're starting to see the resonances, the excited states of the proton. And if you go beyond something like this W variable above 2 GV, you're entering what is called the, the DIS continuum. You're breaking up your target, and uh, um, there can be uh, different uh, hadronic final states that are produced. Uh, and in DIS, we don't look at the hadronic final state in detail, so we don't know really what happens. What we do is only measuring the scattered electron. And so there are a, say, a series of kinematic variables that are uh, relevant for this reaction, and you see them defined here. So um, the general formula for the cross-section uh, for DIS is written here. So. Here you have, again, the mod cross-section that we saw before for a point, point scattering on a point-like uh, particle. And then there is the sum of two structure functions with an angular dependent part. The structure function depend in principle on Q square and on the energy difference between the initial and the final electron. So what was observed, uh, actually, by looking at uh, this distribution here, where we are comparing the measured cross-section over the mod cross-section for the point-like uh, particle is that uh, there was uh, basically uh, very little uh, to nothing dependence on Q square. So basically, we we're going again uh, to find a cross-section that behaved like the point-like um, cross-section. So after finding at the uh, lowest values of Q square, that the proton had a finite, finite structure, it seemed like we were back to hit on something that was punctual. So this was the hint of the fact that the proton had actually point-like constituents into it. So this is another uh, this plot that shows that the, the structure function W2 uh, displayed no dependence on the momentum transfer. So uh, what uh, was, um, this was all expressed with uh, uh, the hypothesis of the uh, Bjorken scaling. So the cross-section does not depend on nu and q square, but it depends on only one variable. That is this uh, W also uh, expressed as uh, one over X that is defined as the ratio of two times the mass of the proton, the energy transfer divided by Q square. So what was found was that the, um, the structure functions only depend on, depended on this ratio and not on the value of Q square. So basically what was found is that, as I was saying before, uh, with the Q square, which reflects the wavelength, uh, small but not <laughs> small enough, we could still see the proton as a composite object. But when we get in the DIS re regime, the wavelength is such that we are uh, able to hit uh, the individual quarks that con constitute uh, uh, the proton. So further understanding in DIS uh, was brought in by Feynman with the development of the parton model at the end of the 60s. So in this model, uh, Feynman hypothesizes that the proton is composed of point-like partons uh, over which uh, the electrons are scattering incoherently. Incoherently means that you scatter only on, on one of the constituents and all the others are there minding their business. So if we are in a momentum, it's called the uh, infinite momentum frame, basically in which uh, this uh, um, proton is moving at the speed of light, 
Due to time dil dilation, uh, the motion of the constituents uh, is slowed down. It's like we are taking pictures, instantaneous pictures of what happens in the, in the proton. And um, so we can make the assumptions uh, that um, the partons are not interacting with one another while they are coupling to the virtual photon. So this is uh, uh, what is called the impulse approximation. So basically in this theory, uh, the electron are scattering off uh, uh, free constituents. So the scattering will reflect directly the properties and the motions, the motion of these constituents. And, and uh, this assumption of uh, no interaction between uh, the, um, the partons during electron scattering uh, was later shown to be a QCD property, which is known as the asymptotic freedom that you have heard about for sure. So you see here, uh, consequence of the parton model, the uh, cross-section of DIS becomes a, a sum of the, cross uh, of the interaction of the virtual photon with each individual parton, which will carry a, a, a fraction X of the proton momentum expressed by probability uh, F of X. So um, what was done was uh, uh, linking the momentum fraction to the variable of Bjorken uh, X that I showed in the slide before, that was the one, the scaling um, variable as a function of which the structural function depended. depended. Uh, we can make, um, uh, we can derive this by doing the energy momentum conservation uh, of the interaction of the virtual photon with the parton. You see here, if you compare initial and final state uh, and you neglect uh, negligible terms, uh, you get that the fraction of um, the parton of the momentum of the total momentum of the proton is equal to the variable of Bjorken that. Uh, on which uh, the, um, the structure function depend. So basically what we say is that uh, in the infinite momentum frame, the fraction of the proton momentum that is carried by the struct quark is equal to the variable X Bjorken. And there was further uh, um, development thanks to the Callan-Gross relation, basically uh, the fact that the partons have spin one half uh, the, the, the hypothesis that the partons had spin one half implied that the two structure function F1 and F2 were linked by uh, this uh, relation. And this um, relation was verified experimentally. So what was then uh, obtained thanks to the hypothesis of the parton model of Feynman is that the structure function F2 is a sum of the charges of the parton times x times the probability that the parton has a given fraction of the momentum. Oh, yes. Could you not make an experiment to show that these happen? Okay, so how did they do? I have a backup slide, but I don't remember how they did this experiment. Well, I guess they measured the two structure function by looking at uh, so you do the measurement of the cross section and you're gonna have a term that depends. Uh, on the, on the angle, you are going to fit your angular dependence of the cross section, and then you can compare directly the values of the, let's say you, you have a cross section that goes like A plus B times tangent square of, of uh, the half, um, and you are fitting the two parameters, and then you can look at the dependence on X and extract this. So they measured that really the ratio between the two uh, was, uh, defined by this. So the spin comes in in the sense that uh, if you if you look at uh, Dirac's theory uh, for particle, uh, there are uh, cross section can be have different expression depending on the spin of your particle that are involved. So if the spin is one half, you get uh, uh, to this sort of, um, of relation. So that was the theory, but then it was verified uh, in the experiment. So there has been, uh, uh, same as for the elastic scattering, also in DIS, there has been a huge experimental progress since uh, the first measurements in SLAC. So you see here the current level of uh, knowledge that we have uh, of uh, the proton structure function F2 as a function of Q square. It has been measured extensively, in particular, in particular DAISY, in Hamburg uh, with uh, uh, the HERA accelerator and the 
detectors H1 and Zeus. You see here, we have uh, the structure function measured over four orders of magnitude on Q square and for X ranging between 0 0.65 to 5 to the 10 to the minus 4. So what we could see is that in a given region of X, uh, that basically from this to this, uh, I would say, region of X, we can really observe the scaling hypothesis uh, verified experimentally. So the, the structure function does not depend on, on Q squared. It's flat. But we also see that uh, in some uh, going away from this uh, uh, flat region, there are uh, uh, deviations from the scaling and the cross section starts to have a Q, a Q squared slope. So this, um, these results uh, uh, combined to measurements uh, on deuterium target uh, allowed uh, to do a decomposition in the quark uh, flavor of the structure function, which led to these plots that show us uh, uh, the actual momentum distribution of the valence U and D quarks, uh, as well as the quark antiquarks in the C and the gluons. So what uh, uh, you can see, uh, just to give a, a, a bit of a feeling of what this means here, you see that there are these bumps for the U and D quarks uh, here in a region uh, above 0 0.1 in X. So if we were uh, to have uh, only uh, constituent uh, free quarks uh, in the proton, the momentum distribution would just be a direct delta at one third. So each of the of the three quark would carry one third of the momentum of the proton. However, if these bound quarks, uh, uh, these quarks are actually bound and are exchanging gluons between them, there is a smearing that uh, is applied to the uh, momentum distribution. And uh, if instead we allow also to have uh, the production of uh, quark anti quark pairs, which is uh, uh, the C. Uh, the, there would also be an additional bump uh, coming back towards uh, small values of X. And this is actually what is observed here. So basically what we get uh, from this picture is that valence quarks uh, are mainly distributed uh, at uh, X uh, greater than 0 0.1. And uh, the C and uh, the gluons uh, have momentum fraction that gets uh, closer and closer to zero, very small here. And uh, we need to keep this in mind because it's going to come back when we are, we'll talk about the GPDs afterwards. So, uh, yes. Sorry, I didn't understand. Say that again. Yeah, the graphs that you draw of the momentum distribution. On yes. The left they are more similar to which one on the right? I mean, what I mean is that this U bump here, if it was just non-interacting quarks, should be a line like that, okay? Then the fact that there are exchanges of gluons and creation of uh, uh, quark antiquarks pairs is making this part phrase like that. So, I was I was just uh, have I gone to this slide yet? Yeah. Okay. So um, the the measurement of the structure functions that I showed here has been um, has implication on other aspects of uh, uh, particle physics in particular. So there have been um, the fact that uh, uh, F two was so well constrained and so um, finely binned. Uh, in the IS measurements at, at HERA uh, allowed uh, to extract the scorpion gluon PDFs that I showed in the previous uh, uh, slide. And they were used uh, to make per perturbative QCD fits uh, to reproduce the cross-section in the scattering of proton antiprotons uh, at CERN, at Tevatron, at RIC. And so you can see here the, the curves that link the experimental points that are precisely passing through all the points use in the, in the theory calculation, the PDFs that were measured at HERA. So this is as an example of the success of the IS, but there are also open questions that remain after the measurement of the IS. So I, I'm not 
talking here, I haven't talked in particular here about the measurement of polarized PDFs, but there are also PDFs that um, um, give the degree of polarization of the quark. And they, these were measured and uh, um, gave rise to what was uh, what is normally called as the spin crisis. So it was found that uh, um, the contribution of the quarks uh, to the total spin of the proton is not one. So the intrinsic spin of the quarks contributes uh, with less than 30% to the total spin of the proton. And there have been sex, uh, su subsequent measurements also to try to understand uh, the uh, spin of the gluons, uh, and it was found to be also of the order of 20%. So it remains the question of what builds up uh, uh, the spin of the neutron and there are, uh, the nucleon. There are two possible uh, candidates left, uh, and they are the orbital angular momentum of the quarks and of the gluon. And this is something that we will be able, hopefully, to understand uh, with the exclusive reaction. That? Sorry? Can you explain the plot on the so this plot uh, is uh, the distribution as a function of the x Bjorken variable of the x Bjorken itself time uh, PDFs that are connected to the degree of polarization of the quarks. This is something that I have not introduced uh, because I don't have time to go through the whole overview of, of the IS, but uh, they are measured if we measure um, deep inelastic scattering on a polarized target. So this is... Um, a different kind of structural function that uh, I did not uh, uh, introduce. So this gives you the degree of how polarized the U quarks are inside. In the, yes, delta U, U is a particular uh, PDF, so it connects uh, the momentum distribution of the quark with its degree of polarization. And it's, uh, it's measured in uh, polarized DIS. So um, now a bit of um, uh, description from the Q, uh, QCD point of view of what uh, VIS and elastic scattering uh, mean. So one concept that is important here uh, is the concept of uh, fact QCD factorization. So uh, the idea that that is linked to the asymptotic freedom that I mentioned before. So if we are at high uh, transfer Q square, uh, the photon interacts with a single quark uh, of the nucleon. And uh, so this part uh, here can be described by perturbative QED, while uh, uh, whatever is left, uh, that is the part that describes how the quark lives inside of the nucleon, it's uh, encoded in the structure function. So the structure functions are the PDFs that I talked about before. And uh, from the QCD point of view, the PDFs are QCD operators that uh, are described here, and they depend on space-time coordinates. So the way they are computed is as uh, one-dimensional Fourier transforms uh, in this uh, light-like coordinate Y uh, minus that you see here. So uh, basically, there are a lot of definitions. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, so there is the quark field. Uh, and uh, X, again, uh, is the momentum fraction of the quark, and then there is the spin uh, projection. Uh, this light from the frame in which the uh, coordinates are defined is a particular frame of reference that it's used uh, to describe the IS, and it's also coming, will come back uh, in the description of GPDs. So in this frame, we have the initial and final look nucleons that are collinear along the z-axis, and the uh, coordinates are linked by this, uh, this formula. So there are a few definitions that will come back uh, um, when we talk about uh, uh, exclusive reaction after. So I wanted to introduce them here. So I said the PDFs are operators and these operators are non-local. So non-local means that uh, the space-time coordinates of the initial and the final quarks are different. And it's also a, a, a matrix element. I mean, this QCD operator is diagonal. Diagonal is, uh, means that the momentum of the initial and the final nuclear are the same. So this is a uh, non-local diagonal operator. It's uh, the one that defines the PDFs in the IS. On the other hand, when we are looking at electron scattering, Again, we can imagine that there is the coupling of the virtual photon with a single 
quark uh, of the nucleon that goes back uh, and leaves the nucleon with a changed momentum, but the nucleon remains still intact. This is what happens in, in uh, elastic scattering. So if we look at the visualization here of the interaction, we have uh, the operator in this case will be local because the space-time coordinates of the initial and final quark are the same, and it will be non-diagonal because the uh, nucleon has actually changed its momentum. In this case, the, the soft structure of the nucleon is described by the form factor. There are actually two more form factors compared to the ones that I described before that are measured in weak interactions, and uh, I'm not going to go into that. So one important thing is that in this uh, light front frame that I introduced uh, in the previous slide, the momentum transfer T between the initial and the final proton is the Fourier conjugate variable of uh, what is called the impact parameter that gives us the transverse position. So as I um, showed also in previous slides, the form factor reflect via Fourier transform the spatial distribution of the quarks in the transverse plane, uh, transverse to the direction of the nucleon. So all this seems crazy now, but when I come to GPDs, I think it will kind of all get to the, together. And I promise there will not be a lot of theory anymore in the rest. So um, this is a really silly image that I found um, um, online to give you an idea of um, what we have done until now. So what we have done until now is to watch the proton projected on a given uh, variable. So we watched the, the structure of the proton as a function of the transverse position of its constituent, or we watched it as a function of the longitudinal momentum of the constituent. But there can be more to learn if we go beyond the one dimensional picture. So as I said, we have measured form factors in elastic scattering that give us the transverse quark distribution in coordinate space. We measure DIS that give us the parton distribution as a function of longitudinal momentum. How can we correlate these two uh, information and go beyond the simple one dimensional uh, information? What we can do is measure the GPDs, that is a, a generalized parton distribution that are correlated quark distribution that link both the coordinate and the momentum space. So here comes the famous expression exclusive, that is the title of uh, this set of classes. So the GPDs are measured in what is called hard or deep, uh, it's two ways of calling it, exclusive process. So what is an exclusive process? An exclusive process is a reaction of which we fully know the final state. You remember that I said in DIS, we just look that at the scattered electron and the rest, everything can be of it. We don't really know what happens of the products. Instead, in the exclusive reaction, we really know what the final state is. And hard or deep means that we are at high Q square, high enough that we can apply the factorization of QCD and assume the interaction on a single uh, quark of the nucleon. So let's see here more in detail some formulas and variables that are relevant in the definition of the generalized parton distribution. So generalized parton distribution are usually, yes. I think thinking about the basics when you say that the form factors describe the soft physics. It, it, what it means. Yeah, soft, it's uh, in um, opposition to the word hard. So what we do um, when we talk about hard is this in interaction with something that is point-like. Okay, so you interact at high Q square, you, you hit over your quark, and this is uh, a hard interaction. But what is left is the structure. Of, uh, of the proton, which is not, what is hard is, means it can be described with perturbative QCD. What is not hard cannot. So whatever cannot be described perturbatively is called soft. And we have to use uh, things like PDFs, uh, form factors, or GPDs to explain this part. So it's, they are linked to QCD, but they cannot be uh, measured I mean, they cannot be directly calculated uh, in QCD. So they need to be measured and we need the sort of structure function to describe 
what they are. Okay, so uh, GPDs are uh, mainly usually introduced directly by showing this uh, reaction here that is the deeply virtual content scattering or also it can be the production of a meson in the final state. So what happens here? We have a scattered electron that exchanges a virtual photon with one of the quarks of the proton. This quark has a, carries a momentum fraction of the proton equal to X plus psi, and then it propagates and radiates a real photon in the final state and goes back in the proton, having changed his longitudinal momentum fraction by, uh, by minus psi. So basically, this variable psi is the difference, twice the variable psi is the difference between the initial momentum of the quark and the final one. And there are other relevant variables that are written here, in particular, T is the momentum transfer between the initial and the final state of the proton. So you see, this is an example of uh, exclusive reaction because uh, we know completely the final state. The final state is going to be a scattered electron, a real photon, and a proton. So we know what it is. Well, in DIS, you just knew there was a scattered electron. You knew that there was high energy left in whatever you hit on, but uh, you didn't really know what the final state reaction was. So the, the soft uh, structure functions that I mentioned earlier in this case are this generalized parton distributions. The generalized parton distribution are also same as the PDFs expressed as a QCD operator, a Fourier transform so QCD operator. But in this case, you remember that uh, we had this concept of local, non-local, and uh, diagonal, non-diagonal. The GPDs are the more gen general case of distribution. They are uh, non-local and non-diagonal. You see uh, the initial and final uh, space-time point for the quark is different, and there is a variation in the momentum of, uh, the, of the proton. And so you see the GPDs appear here. It's this four, four uh, functions, H, E, H tilde and E tilde. And basically there are four functions because they, um, uh, they translate uh, different uh, states uh, of um, uh, nucleon uh, spin uh, and uh, uh, relative changes of um, helicity between the initial and the final state. So if you look at here, we have uh, the H uh, GPD for which Basically, there is no change between the orientation of the spin of the nucleon and of the quark between the initial and final state. For, um, for E, there is a change in polarization of uh, the proton. And uh, for, for H, there is a dependence on the polarization of the proton as well. So there are different uh, GPDs for uh, the different uh, states of uh, polarization of the nucleon and uh, relative to the, um, to the quark. So basically, um, now, now it's getting complicated. Uh, um, we have to make some approximations. We need to make the approximation to be at leading order and what is called leading twist. And uh, we also assume that we conserve the elicity between the initial and final state. You will see the top arrows are always pointing in the same direction. So if we make this a hypothesis, the structure of the nucleon is described by four GPDs, the ones I just said. If we were not making this hypothesis, that there would be additional GPDs to be considered, but we try to keep it simple. Yes. I'll, the next slide, it's in the next slide. I say it here, but then I, I will show it. Although I'm not gonna go in details because it's very messy. And um, now I forgot what I was saying. Yes, yeah, so we have four GPDs and four GPDs for each quark flavor. So we have uh, U and D quarks in the proton. There will be four GPDs for the U and four GPDs for uh, uh, the D. And each GPD depends on three kinematic variables, the X, Psi, and the T that were defined earlier. So what are what I meant with the leading order, leading twist, and I'll show this basically with diagrams. So the diagram that we are interested that we we see here, it's the one in which the virtual photon directly couples to a quark of the proton, and it's called the handbag factorization diagram. It's called handbag because basically you you 
you grab this line here as you as a bag that you're carrying and the bag part contains the nucleon structure i mean that's how i saw it so uh, and this is the diagram that is valid in this leading order leading twist uh, um, approximation what means to go next to leading order means that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, there are gluons that are then radiating quarks and they couple uh, to the virtual photon. So this is what is called the higher order diagram. And in practice, mathematically, whenever we have, uh, we go next to leading order, we add the powers of alpha s, the coupling constant of QCD in the amplitude. On the other hand, if we have a twist, a higher twist diagram, it's a diagram in which there is an exchange between the nucleon and uh, the propagating quark of a gluon, okay? And this, mathematically, it's a complicated thing. The, there is this definition of twist of an operator, which is defined as different uh, difference between the operation dimension and its spin. It's something that I'm not gonna go in because it's, it's messy, but basically it's another diagram, a diagram that involves uh, uh, gluon exchange in this, uh, this kind of gluon exchange. So, the whole point is that right now we will just talk about this kind of diagram in all the DVCS stuff we'll talk about and neglect the rest because the rest in, entices the um, other GPDs, not only the GPDs, the four main one. And it's already complicated enough to measure four GPDs. We don't want to try to get into trouble and measure more right now. So. Uh, to give a physical interpretation of uh, GPDs. So, okay, so I was talking about what happens to this quark after it receives, uh, the ver it couples to the virtual photon. It's at the given B um, transverse position in uh, the, the proton, which is this transverse position is connected via Fourier transform to the uh, GPD variable T that is the momentum transfer between the initial and the final uh, proton. So basically what we have is that uh, due to the scattering, uh, the overall transverse position of the nucleon will change and there is gonna be the, this is the initial overall position of the, of the neutron and nucleon and this is the final one. So uh, X is the average momentum of the parton, as I said before, and X plus C and X minus C, C are the momentum of the initial and the final parton. So what uh, GPDs do, GPD express the correlation of the wave function for the initial and the final state. So they are uh, quantum mechanical interference terms between two different uh, states. And uh, okay, so what we are going to do basically is by measuring the GPDs, we are going to understand both the transverse position distribution of the partons and the longitudinal. This means a longitudinal momentum fraction. This means that we are going to correlate the two one dimensional visions that we got both from elastic scattering and the IS. So GPDs have a set of uh, properties that help us uh, constraining them. So they have some limits that connects us to known quantities. In particular, what we call the forward limit, if we set two of the variables T and Xi to zero, for the GPDH, we find uh, the PDF, the PDF, unpolarized PDF Q. And for the uh, GPDH tilde, we find uh, the polarized GP, um, PD, PDF delta Q. And then uh, integrating on the X variable, the GPDs, we find uh, the form factors that are measured in elastic. And you see here the correlation that I mentioned before. So the, there are some particular cases for which the GPD reduce to the already measured form factors and uh, uh, PDFs. Then there is this property of polynomiality for which uh, the moments in X uh, of the GPD uh, are uh, a sum of polynomials uh, in the variable Xi and this coefficient A will depend on the GPD variable T. And this is a property that on one side gives this, um, this other property, the limit uh, of the integral, the zero moments that are connected to the form factors. And on the other hand, we'll bring to another property that I'll show in the next slide. So then uh, uh, depending on the, on the relative value between uh, the variable 
X and the variable Xi, we have different physical interpretation. There are different regions for the GPDs. There is this DigiLab region that basically what it means is that we are scattering uh, from quarks. If the Xi, X variable is greater than Xi, it's gonna be scattering on anti-quark if X is smaller than Xi and, and Xi less than zero. And in between the two is this ERBIL region that basically the scattering is uh, uh, resulting in a QQ bar pair, which is a meson. So what uh, physics can we learn from GPDs? I mean, I talked about this correlation between two things, but in practice, how can we uh, visualize what we learn from GPD? So one property that is very nice is uh, encoded in these two formulas by Burkhardt. What we can do with GPDs is doing the tomography of the nucleon, which is basically describing uh, in uh, for each value of the longitudinal momentum fraction of the parton, uh, getting its position in the transverse plane. So this is uh, uh, like taking a CAT scan of your brain. You make slices at different uh, uh, depth and you see the distribution of the constituent. You're going to do the same uh, CAT scan of the proton as a function of the longitudinal momentum. And we will see results for this uh, uh, later on today. So then we another important uh, um, property, you, you heard me mentioning early the spin crisis for which we couldn't uh, really uh, connect the total nucleon spin to the spin of the quarks alone. Uh, so there is the sum rule that is a consequence of polynomiality that I showed before that links the integral of x dx of the sum of the GPDs h and e to the total angular momentum carried by the quark. So this can allow us to get this piece because we already know uh, delta sigma, it's, the, um, it's measured in DIS, but uh, this delta L, the uh, orbital angular momentum of the quarks is not known. And knowing that can help us to understand the, the composition of the nucleon spin. And then there is another property that is uh, this other integral of GPDs can be connected to the gravitational form factor that describes the forces and pressure distribution in the proton. And I will come back uh, on that uh, in the other class uh, today. So I'm almost done. Okay, so this is a panorama outline of all the reactions that help us uh, constrain GPDs. So there is the DVCS that I already mentioned, is the electroproduction of a real photon uh, um, in the final state. And as I showed before, there could be different diagrams uh, leading to this one, the one uh, coupling where the virtual photon couples to the quark, and then it will give us access to the quark GPDs. If we go to higher orders, uh, we can get uh, the gluon GPDs. And then there are other final states that can be used uh, to measure uh, GPDs that are, for instance, the time-like quantum scattering, the double DVCS, the deeply virtual meson production. And I will talk about uh, this uh, during the next uh, lessons. What is important here is that this blob is the same. So the concept is that the GPDs are universal uh, quantities. Basically, we can measure the same GPD with different uh, reaction and different final state. And this is one uh, uh, of the goals of the experimental program that we have at 12GV at JLab is trying to verify the universality of GPD. So use different uh, um, reactions and try to see if we find uh, the same GPDs in the end. So I'll just summarize today's uh, lesson. Um, Electron scattering is one of the main tools to study nucleon structure and the form factors extracted in elect elastic scattering give us information on the transverse uh, charge distribution of the partons. The structure function measured in DIS give us the information on the longitudinal momentum distribution of the parton. And the GPDs correlate the information both on the transverse position and the longitudinal momentum of the partons. And they have a lot of interesting pro properties. They can give us information about the orbital angular momentum of the quarks, allow us to do the tomography of the nucleon and get the distribution of the forces. We are going to measure them in exclusive reactions where we know the, fully the final state and we need to have high virtuality of the exchange photon. So here I have a little uh, series of the a set of sources that I use to prepare this presentation. So 
if you want to study again, you can go back and look at all this. So I guess uh, we take a break as we had the discussion now. Thank you. Thank you.